If you would open your Bible to John chapter 6, it's time for the sermon now, right? You can make sure I get this stuff straight. Because this girl said we're going to be preaching, and so I've got to make sure the preacher does it right. John chapter 6, it really is an amazing thing how John streamlines his gospel. Uh, John has less than 30 days, only 20-something days in the entire life of Jesus where he says anything. The whole lot, second half of the gospel of John takes place in one week. And in between chapter 5 and chapter 6, which is where we're starting in chapter 6, uh, John uh, skips almost a whole year in the ministry of Jesus. But in this passage we want to look at today, uh, I jotted down a few things I want to share with you. And this is concerning the, one of the miracles that Jesus did. It's my favorite miracle that Jesus did that would I consider to be a real missionary passage. Because this passage talks about what it's like to be a disciple. How is it that Jesus' disciples uh, had such weak faith? How is it that they sometimes doubted? And if you've ever looked in the mirror in the morning and you looked at yourself and you said, whoa, this is one of Jesus', <laughs> one of Jesus disciples I'm looking at right here. I wonder if he has a, that good of choice who he chooses. But we are weak. What we're going to see today is how these people were work, weak. And we're going to go through the text, and you're going to have to use a little bit of imagination. We're going to try to figure out what must have happened that day when the miracle of the feeding of the 20,000 took place, the only miracle that happened in the Bible that's recorded in all four Gospels. And real quickly, we're going to go through some, some verses. Let's begin in John chapter 6, uh, verse number 1. This is the first few verses of the setting, the who, what, when, where, why, and all that kind of stuff. In verse 1, he says, after things, these things, and don't forget, I already told you that a whole year had passed, that John doesn't give anything between chapter 5 and 6. But the other Gospels tell us that Jesus had been working and healing and preaching and doing all these wonderful things and casting out demons and that Herod had arrested John the Baptist and that he was killed. And so the disciples and Jesus came over to this place over the Sea of Galilee, uh, which is also called the Sea of Tiberias. Now, it's interesting how the Holy Spirit wants us to know exactly where this is happening. And it depends on where you lived in Israel, what you would go, call the name of that place. And so he tells us both places. We want, don't want to get that uh, mixed up. Now, in verse 2, it tells the who and the why, what's, what's happening here. And a great multitude followed him. Now, it's interesting that a lot of stuff was happening at this time. This is one of the three, what we call pilgrim feasts, the Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles which all religious Jews all over the Roman Empire were supposed to come back to Israel and to Jerusalem for the big holidays. And so Josephus, the ancient historian, says at this time there would be about 200,000 Jews come back. And Jesus here is going to be preaching and speaking to and feeding 20,000 people. As far as I know, the biggest group he ever spoke to. And he did not have one of these uh, gizmos that we call microphones. I don't know how he could do it to speak to so many people, but he was able to do that. And so this huge multitude followed him. And by the way, all four of the Gospels emphasize this was an extremely large group of people. And they followed him. In fact, in Greek, it emphasized very strongly they kept on following and kept coming and coming and coming and coming. There was a huge, huge, huge group. But notice why they did it. Because they saw his miracles, which he did on those people who were diseased. So what happened in this process? The other Gospels said that Jesus had done quite a few miracles and healings. And uh, these people said, wow. Here's a guy who can heal the sick. And so they brought all these people to him. He was hearing a lot of, healing a lot of people. And also, don't forget that Herod had taken John the Baptist and killed him. And then when Jesus was doing these miracles, Herod was a spooky guy. And he says, if John the Baptist, come back to spook me. And so can you imagine if word got out today that Ron Minton was going to be speaking here in this congregation, in this building, and he's going to tell five secrets about what the president really did in the collusion in Russia. And the president would send, word got out that 100 uh, secret agents were going to be here. You know what would happen? 20,000 people would be trying to get in this building right here. And that was what happened, because Herod had no doubt said, I mean, he was said, it's John the Baptist, come to spook me. And I'm sure that agents were there in the word of So all that stuff together, there's this massive amount. Now, the other day we were in University of Texas, or Texas A&M, they had this ba uh, basketball stadium, they say it could hold, I forgot whether it was, 20,000 or something. Huge place. So many people, it's hard to even imagine. So think of this gigantic crowd. 
Just the opposite when I preach, but that's okay. But you know what? There was a huge, huge crowd. All four of the Gospels emphasize, and Jesus is the only one that knows what's going to happen. Okay? That's important in the story as it unfolds. First three is the where and the what. Jesus went up into a mountain, uh, a hill we would say up in Galilee, and he sat down there with his disciples. And it took some time, and they were over, going over and over again. We would call it maybe strategic planning, a rest period. The other gospel says that uh, they were tired. He had gone there actually for rest, according to uh, Mark. And yet, even though they were tired and worn out, and they needed to rest, and they'd gone there to rest, when these huge crowds come, Jesus, the great teacher, and by the way, it's interesting that Jesus taught a lesson here that a teacher, a preacher of truth, must also guard his time and use it wisely. Yet, Jesus was still willing to minister to these people. And when you're, whenever the Lord calls someone, whether it's to Indonesia, Ukraine, or right here uh, in the Springfield and Enfield area, it doesn't make any difference where you are. What he's looking for is disciples who are faithful to him, going to fulfill their calling. And you know what? Jesus is going to teach us that the ones who send and the ones who are sent are equally important. The pastor mentioned how much money you folks give to missions, and we have a lot of missionaries right here. I don't know about you, but when I look at these girls over here, I don't, maybe I shouldn't think, shouldn't say this, but I don't see Americans so much as I see Romanian missionaries over here, okay? I mean, 20 years over, it just kind of grows on you. So anyway, what happened? Jesus is going to teach these people Hey, listen, if we're all faithful disciples, he's going to meet our needs, and he's going to bless what we're doing, and that's what he wants us to be doing. So finally, verse 4, the introduction says, when it happened, the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Now, it's interesting that this passage does, by the way, uh, provide for us the length of the ministry of Jesus, because there were four Passovers in his ministry. One, you know, John chapter 2, when he changed the water into wine, and then one in chapter 5, verse 1 even though it may not have been a Passover feast because the name's not given. If we had a chart of all the Jewish feasts, we would see that a Passover had to have happened here and also chapter 11, the last one where they kill him, which means that two and a half years of the ministry of Jesus has gone by. Now he's at the height of his popularity. After this, he's going to go downhill in popularity. And some of the saddest verses in the whole Bible are right here in this chapter as a result of that. And what's going to happen? They're going to start leaving him. In fact, in chapters, think of this, 666. Chapter 6, verse 66, some of his disciples, many of his disciples left him and followed him no more. So this is the height of his popularity. They're going to go downhill until they kill him uh, at the end. So because of this, we know how long he ministered. And it was an amazing thing that we can minister all these years in Ukraine and Romania and all these countries. And we never can do half of what he did. But he laid the foundation and expects us to keep building on what he started. Now, verse 5 is, begins what we call the situation. Here's. This, here's, the, here's what's been happening. The other Gospels tell us that Jesus had been, uh, had been teaching, Matthew and Mark, and Luke and John said he had been healing the sick, Luke and, Luke and Matthew. And Jesus, here's what Matt, John doesn't tell. It's a very important thing. Jesus, or the disciples request Jesus to send these crowds away. It's getting toward evening. They're getting hungry. And Jesus knows he's going to feed them all, but they don't know. And they want some private time, and they said, whoa, we got a, this is a massive, massive, massive crowd of 20,000 mobs of people here. And Jesus and the disciples say, get rid of these people. You know, we want this one-on-one -on -one time with you. You know, we're special. They're nothing. And plus, look, we don't have food for all these people. But John doesn't tell this, but it's interesting in verse 26 and verse 5, Jesus lifted up his eyes, and when he saw this great company come to him, now he's going to go into action. He says to Philip, one of his disciples, where are we going to get bread that all these people may eat? Where are we going to get enough food for all these people? Now we know from John chapter 1 that Philip was from Bethsaida. He would know where the grocery stores are. Probably the Romanian producti. What do they call a grocery store? Probably something like that. Okay. He would know where those things are. And so he said to him, where are we going to get enough food for all these people to eat? Now obviously, they don't have food, but there's 20,000 people out there that are hungry, and they're going to have to eat. And so he tests his disciples and says, hey, where are we going to get enough food for all these people? And the disciples begin to go into panic. We don't learn this from John, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us that Jesus said, 
you people do two things. Take inventory of all the food and feed this crowd. And the disciples realize it's an impossibility. They begin to go into panic. It's just like when you were in Romania, when we're in Ukraine, when she's in, when she's in Indonesia. And everybody right here at Enfield, sometimes we look like the situation. We say, it ain't going to work. Somebody's going to have to give something. We, we don't know what we're going to do. With, with these people, if they think we say we're going to feed them, what we're going to feed them with, it's going to be our last day on planet Earth. They're all going to die today. And so there's a problem. And Philip fails the test, by the way. In verse 6, Jesus, the Bible says, this he said to prove him, to test him. Isn't it interesting how Jesus gives us simple little things in the life to test us? Maybe it's whether you're willing to uh, lead in singing. Maybe it's whether you're willing to give money. Maybe it's whether you're willing to clean the church. I saw some of the guys doing all kinds of carpentry work here. Maybe it's willing to, whether well, you're willing to go and be a missionary. He, te- he said to Philip, this test. Now, the disciples were all in panic, and I've been there, and probably you've been there. <laughs> I can guarantee you, I know you've been there. And yet, when we panic, I'm telling you, sometimes in Ukraine, we're ready to pack up our bags and leave. Things weren't going our way. People hate us, and uh, it just doesn't work very good. The professor calls and says, I can't come next week. What? What are we going to do now? And we begin to go in panic. But the Bible says in verse 6, for he himself already knew what he was going to do. Isn't that amazing? You see, Jesus is not just a man. He's the God-man. He knows the beginning from the end. And when we know that, when we realize that we're weak, we cannot do this thing, he can get the job done. Now, here's what Philip says in verse 7. If we had 200, the Greek word denarius, the King James 200 penny worth, it's, a denarius is basically a, a day's wage. And to put it in modern times, let's say 20,000, uh, if we had a 20, 000, a 200 days away, $20,000 and 20,000 people, That's so we can understand what he's saying. If we had $20,000 of food, it's not sufficient for them that anyone can just take a little. My wife and I have been traveling all over the country. This is the 85th church we've been in. We'll be, or 83rd or 5th or something like that. We'll be in 90 churches before we go back next month. And you know what? Sometimes we stopped in these little fast food places. And sometimes, most of the time, you cannot get food for a dollar. <laughs> so I understand exactly what this guy is saying. Hey, he says, if we had $20,000, and we don't have, by the way, but if we did have, that's only enough money that everyone could have a scrap. Reminds me of when my wife and I pulled into Arby's. Uh, do you know what is Arby's? Do they have that in this Arby's? Everybody knows Arby's? We pulled into Arby's. It's also called Missionary Steakhouse. We pulled in there. I, I went to order the food. My wife gave a gospel tract to the lady on the table. All of a sudden, there was this big, loud noise. The lady threw the tract on the floor. By the way, it's not from, not from this place. Okay, it's not in this town. And she called out of the loud voice. She says, do I look like a heathen? And I'm thinking, you act like one. But I didn't say anything. But you know what? We gave this tract out to the lady, and she realized what it meant, and it didn't hurt us any. So when you're witnessing for people in the U.S. or foreign seas, it doesn't hurt. So anyway, what happened here, he says, hey, listen, we're in a hard situation. We're in a tight food situation. We don't know what to do. It's not going to happen. Now, Jesus had told, don't forget, he had told the disciples, take inventory of all the food that we have. I mean, think about it. We are Christians. We follow Jesus Christ. He's the God man. He's our Savior. That means we are his disciples. Jesus said, if you do what I say, you are indeed my disciples. Now, he tells us to do something, and as far as we know, only one of these disciples obeyed him. Because in verse number 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him. By the way, how many of you had, uh, when you were growing up, an older brother or sister? <laughs> okay, I know these girls over here had. <laughs> Almost everyone. I'll never forget growing up in Dumas, Texas. I was, all, I was a great, I really was a good baseball player. Our high school had 10th, 11th, and 12th. I was the only 10th grader that made the team. And yet my older brother, who just graduated when I went in there, he was an all-star player. And all the time the coach says, are you as good as your brother, Steve? And of course, the answer is no, I never was. I always, he's always comparing me with him. Well, this guy, every time he's mentioned in the Bible, except just a list, he's always Simon Peter's brother. Simon Peter's the big guy, the big shot. And Andrew, you know who he is? He's you. He's me. 
He's Mr. or Mrs. Ordinary. He's no one. He's not the big gun. Yet every time he's in the Bible, except for list, he's always bringing someone to Christ Jesus. This time he obeys Jesus. He goes out and finds an inventory. And he says, all I could found, all I could found was one little boy here. Is that little boy hiding over there? Is that that lady's coat? He's looking for a little boy to give an illustration, but I don't see any. <laughs> okay. Anyway, just try to picture in your mind a, a 10 or 11 year old boy. And I can tell you right now, there is no telling what they have in their pocket. You could find frogs and nails and all kinds of stuff in there. But probably on the way out the door that day, this mom says, take this bag of lunch quick. There's a couple of fish in there. Better eat them quick before they, before they rot. And they'll smell like that lady's food in uh, Guatemala. No, in uh, 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 Indonesia. <laughs> I've been with all these countries I've been to recently. So what happened is that uh, they got this, they got this uh, situation going. And he said, there's just only five barley loaves. Now, don't think of a loaf of bread. These are five hunk. In Texas, the translation would be hunk. Five pieces of bread, small pieces of bread, and two small fish. You probably see some bumper stickers that said ichthus. Okay, that's the Greek word for fish. But this, that's the normal fish. This is the Greek word opsaria, which means a tiny minnow fish, a little bitty, little tiny fish. So, in other words, the point is, is this boy has food, but it's so tiny. But Jesus had commanded the disciples to do something. And you know what? This guy did something. He found out how much food there was, and it wasn't much. He passed. I mean, he only got an eight. He didn't get an eight. But even he said, oh, these, these pieces of bread and fish, but what are they among so many? All four of the Gospels record the hopeless quantity. It ain't going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. Okay? Now, the disciples are going to learn a lesson right here. And we can learn a lesson also. God can use what to us seems like insignificant. Sometimes, sometimes what we think, oh, God's not going to be able to do, use anything with this guy or with this person or this money or whatever. But God can do some things if we just obey him and do what we can do. He expects us to do what we can do. And this guy, uh, this guy Andrew, did exactly what he was told. Now, he couldn't multiply mole air molecules into food like Jesus is going to. They don't know that yet, but he couldn't do that. But Jesus expects us to do exactly what what we can do everything we have is his he gives us ability to get everything we have okay now after all this stuff happens i want to focus on verse number 10 this is what i call uh the service that jesus did to all these people in verse 10 jesus says make the men sit down and luke adds make them sit down by groups of 50 and Mark adds, make them sit down by groups of 50 and by groups of 100. So by reading all the Gospels, we see, picture this huge mob of 20,000 people. I mean, it would take like your land here. 20,000 people, a mob. And there's several things you cannot do with a mob. But when you get them organized by groups, you know what? You can count how many there are. This verse tells how many there are. And you can distribute the food. They don't know what's going to happen, but Jesus knows what's going to happen. And he's going to give an incredible lesson when they take up the food, which they could not do if they were in a mob. So he gets organized. He gets everything done. And he says, and notice how clear the Holy Spirit is. Make the men, the people, the Greek word anthropos, make mankind, the people, make them all sit down. And the number of men, the Greek word on air, males as opposed to females, the number of men was 5,000. So that means there was 20,000 when we add in the, the uh, wives and the children. And all four of the Gospels say 5,000, but Matthew adds 5,000 men besides women and children, which proves that there probably were at least 20,000 people here. A huge, huge, huge crowd who had come from. These are religious Jews who had come to Israel, and it's going to be important to know who they are. They're not born again. They're not, they don't know Jesus as their Lord, as their Savior, but they are Jews. They are religious Jews. Now, they all get organized, and Jesus, verse 11 took the loaves, and after he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and also to those 20,000 who were set down. <coughs> Let me illustrate it like this. I'll come here, and I need some volunteers to help me. Let's see. Who would volunteer to come up here and help me? This young man. And these two girls. And I need one more, at least one more. One or two more people coming up. Okay, it won't hurt very long. Stand right up here. 
Stand right here. Face this direction. Line up right over there, please. Face this way. I'm Jesus. The 12 disciples, you're the 20,000. Now, we don't know exactly what happened, but try to picture in your mind's eye this. Jesus prays and says, Oh, Father, thank you that you provided all this food for us. And the disciples are thinking, wait a minute. We don't have food. We got this little scrap of food. Now, if I had said to Pastor Santino, tell all the people that we're going to have lunch after church and no one bring anything, Nancy and I are providing everything. And we have the prayer and we open the cover of the dish and there's one green bean this long for all you people. You would have more food than these 20,000 people are going to get. So you can see the situation. <laughs> and think what they're thinking. They're thinking, thank you for this food, and 20,000 people are expecting to be fed right away. And the disciples are up here. By the way, let me give them names. Simon, Peter, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew. They're up here thinking, he's worked too hard. He really has finally lost it. And today is the day we die. What else can they say? And so after he prayed, he came to, what's your name? Same to Simon Peter, and he gives him all the food. Take this. Gives him all the food, the bread, and the fish. And can you imagine the other disciples? They're standing there with nothing, and they're thinking, this is real good. At least he has some food that he gets killed with. I have nothing. But he comes to, what's your name? Yeah, your real name. Andrew? We'll hold up here. I never picture Andrew look like this, but I guess he did. Gives all the food, and then... The disciples begin to say, whoa, did I see something? And your name? <laughs> Philip, and gives Philip this amount of food. Now the disciples begin to say, whoa, I think I saw something happening. Comes to Bartholomew and gives him the same mood, food all the way down to 12 disciples. And think of this. All these 12 disciples see this multiplication. And 20,000 people here who are now organized see this, ultiplica this multiplication. And the disciples, you know what they're thinking? They're thinking just exactly what you're thinking. They see this miracle that happened. Okay, go sit down. You guys were not here long enough to get part of the love offering. Okay. <laughs> the disciples see this miracle, and they begin to say, and haven't you said this before in your life? I mean, I'm not going to tell you to raise your hand, but if you're honest, you're going to see this. The disciples were saying, why did we ever doubt him? I mean, I've said that. <laughs> when things go rough and... And we don't know what's going to happen. And then all of a sudden, Jesus comes through. We say, why did we ever doubt him? Now the disciples are saying that here's the guy who can walk on the water, heal the dead, raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out demons, do all this stuff. Why did we doubt him? He's a miracle worker. Look what he just did. And they're on top of cloud nine until 15 seconds later because they're weak. Have you ever had a spiritual victory, but you didn't win, didn't learn from those victories? Hey, I'm guilty of that. And so are you. You know what? Try to picture this. There's 20,000 people. If you divide that by 12 disciples, because Judas doesn't die for a year yet, uh, that's 1,800 people each. And let's pretend there's 1,800 people organized in my group by uh, 200s, I mean by hundreds and 50s. And I'm Simon Peter, and I have this fish, and we're still in Clyde 9, and I come up to my group, and then all of a sudden, I realize I'm Joe Blow Simon Peter, the sinner man, saved by grace. This is son of God. He knows how to transform air molecules into fish and bread. I don't. Now I die. <laughs> because think about it. He can't, they can't do what he did. I could just see Simon Peter right now. He comes to his first person and he says, okay, what can I do? Gives this person all the food. Steps back and says, whoa, I thought, I, I thought that I gave this person all the food, but I only gave half. And he gives to the next person. And he sends back. And he's still full. And he begins to give to all. And he begins to realize what Jesus is doing. And he looks over and all 12 disciples are this massive crowd. They're all spread out and they're doing the same thing. Think of that. And you know what the disciples then said? They begin to look into their heart and they begin to say, why did I ever doubt him? He called me to be a part of this team called Faith Baptist Church. And why did I doubt him? I could do what he wants me to do. And they began to spread that food all around. 
it was actually, look at verse 11. It's amazing what happened. All those people that sat down and likewise of the fish, as much as they would, as much as they wanted. In Ukraine, we don't have such a thing as a food buffet, but you know what one is here. This was, the, this was a food buffet. As much as they wanted. Now, here was a serious miracle. I mean, this is a major miracle right here. In fact, look at the verse, verse 12, the first words. And when they were filled, I mean, they could take seconds, thirds, all this food. They were filled. Can you imagine the lesson that they were learning from that? And Jesus, then Jesus said something that's a little surprising. Verse 12. He said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. What? Here's a guy that can turn air molecules and transform them into fish and food and bread and all this good stuff. And he says, gather up the stuff that remains that nothing be lost. That seems kind of strange. And what Jesus is teaching us, the lesson right here, even when we have abundance, we don't waste because we're Christian believers. We, God expects us to use what he gives us and make it go as far as we can. And when we have a little extra, we still use that. We don't just waste stuff. And he says they were all filled. And, he, and then he says, get up the fragments. And it's interesting, there should have been 20 or 30 American pickup trucks full of food left over from that many multiplications. Because, you know, people take as much as they want. You know how it is at a food buffet, you have some left over. And so what happened, the disciples, he told them all, they all went through their 1,800 people and gathered up some container, basket of some sort. I'm not sure what it was. And the incredible thing is that there was just enough that every disciple had one full basket. And they probably had to walk a half a mile or a mile in between these groups of people to get back to where they're going. And when they're carrying that basket, they had a demonstration in their hand of who he is. And I can just see him walking right up there, and they said, I will never, never, never doubt him again. Mark it down. I am Joe Blow, Christian, full, 100% sold out discipleship for Jesus. You can count on me. I'm in. <laughs> That's what they were saying. And it was true. They were fully dedicated, just like you've been. <laughs> but you know what? They had one problem. They're still weak. It's hard to believe this, but just three months later, the disciples were weak in faith again, and Jesus looked at them and rebuked them. And the Bible says, he says, don't you remember the 5,000? You know, sometimes we don't learn from spiritual victories. I'm telling you. When I'm preaching to you, man, I am preaching to myself. I'm telling you this. And it's really incredible in verse 12, verse 13, when, he's, when they gathered them together, they filled 12 baskets full. And, you know, Jesus does everything we can't do. When he died on the cross, I remember the Bible says, he, when he, the three hours of darkness when he made the atonement for sin, our sin problem was taken up care of forever. The salvation was won. And Jesus said, it is finished. He accomplished something that we cannot do. Now, he could have sent angels to spread this word all over Connecticut and all over Massachusetts and all over the world. But you know what? He said, no, we're not going to do that. People. He's going to use Christian believers to get his work done. Some of you don't believe what I'm going to tell you right now, but it's true. Pastor Santino has never preached a perfect sermon. Close, yes. It comes close every week. And God could have sent angels down to do better than him. They could be perfect. <laughs> but he doesn't do that. I know you think there's a couple of angels up here singing, and I thought there were too when I had my eyes closed. But you know what? He chooses Christian believers to get his work done. And he says to us, if you only be my faithful disciple, guess what? You can accomplish God's will for your life, and I'm going to help you do it. Now, it's interesting. Let me just cover, finish with these last two verses in verse 14 and 15. I want you to see what was the crowd's reaction and what's Jesus' reaction and what will be our reaction. In verse 14. Then those men, those people, there's the same word, those, that congregation, 20,000 people. Don't forget, religious Jews. When they had seen this miracle, it's a special word, the Greek word semion, it's a special sign miracle that Jesus does. John centers his gospel around seven sign miracles. This is the middle of the, of the seven. When they had seen this miracle, they said, in fact, they kept on saying over and over again, 
This is of a truth, that prophet which should come into the world. Because back in Deuteronomy 18, Moses had said, Messiah is coming, and when he comes, he will be a prophet like me, and he gave an explanation of what Messiah will do. And in, when the church was getting started in the early days, uh, in Acts chapter 3, Simon Peter was preaching, lots of people got saved, and Simon Peter said, Jesus is that prophet that should come into the world, and he was right. And a little later in Acts chapter 7, they were just before they killed Stephen, he was witnessing Jesus Christ, and he said, this is the prophet that should come into the world. He is Messiah. And he was right. And these people were right. The problem is, just like in Ukraine, like Vitaly testified earlier, in Ukraine, they know who is Jesus Christ, but he's not their Lord and Savior. So they know who he is. Think of this. Moses had fed the people. Jesus fed the people. Moses had delivered the people from the bondage of the foreign government, Pharaoh, Egyptians. And now Jesus, they're thinking, will deliver us from the Roman Empire. And so they're going to say, look, let's take this man and make him the king. And it's logical. I mean, I would have too. Think about it. I know, I know we, you know, can say, well, we, you know, I wouldn't have done that because I'm too dedicated to do such a thing. But he would take care of all the medical bills, all the food bills, and deliver them from this rough Roman Empire. And Jesus says, no, it's not going to be that way. And verse 15, when Jesus therefore perceived they would come and take him by force. But wait, it's not exactly as it appears. Because Matthew and Mark said Jesus could barely constrain the disciples. The disciples got caught up in this emotional rush. And they said, yes, yes, yes. We can do this. He's going to be the king. And Jesus says, no, no, no. It's not working that way. There's not going to be anything such as uh, the cross or the crown without the cross. They wanted to take a shortcut. And he said, not. He doesn't want to do that. They want to take him by force. I know in this part of the world, not far from the ocean, and there's, they have uh, whales. They go whale hunting, and they use a tool called the harpoon. With well, the Greek word, the, the root of it is harp, and it means to seize and snatch, to grab. And that's what a harpoon does. It's just like when the lady is playing this piano, a piano smacks a string like that and makes a noise. A harpsichord looks the same, but a harpsichord plucks the string. So harp means to pluck, seize, grab. That's the word, the graphic word. They said, we wanted to hold him down and take him by force. But Jesus departed again himself into a mountain alone. Mark says he first had to cross over the Sea of Galilee to the other Bethsaida, and Matthew and Mark both said he went there to pray. Isn't it amazing? When times are tough, when things are looking good and then all of a sudden everything seems to go bad, and even your followers, some of them leave you, Jesus says it's time to pray. Hey, in tough times, man, it is time to pray. Sometimes we don't pray in tough situations, and we should. As I said earlier, this miracle marks the height of Jesus', Jesus popularity. He went downhill after this. It's the foundation of the bread of life discourse and all this stuff that's happening in this chapter. And really the bottom line is this. Jesus, he really does not want to be the king of some fleshly world like we have. But he does look for true disciples who he can be the king of your heart. He wants to be the Lord of your heart, the Lord of your life. He doesn't want to be the king of this world. And what I would like for us to do, I would like for all of us to look inward today, in this missions day, and say, Lord, I want to be your faithful disciple. Show me what you want me to do, and I want you to help me to do that. I'll pray, and then I'm going to turn it to the pastor. Lord, thank you for your love and grace to us. Thank you for this brief lesson that we've seen even in your Gospel of John, how you showed us more times than we could imagine that you're going to meet our needs. Help us not to panic, but help us to be faithful disciples who will lean on you and say, Lord, I'm going to give you my life. Whether you want me in another country, whether you want me here, whatever you have in my life, I just want to do it the very best I can and be the very best servant of Jesus Christ that I can. And thank you for the amazing opportunity and responsibility we have to carry your word around the world. Help us to be those faithful disciples, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Let's stand. God spoke in your heart. God can use, think about this. Jesus could have given the bread. He didn't need the disciples, did he? He didn't need the disciples. 
And I said this uh, this week to the Iwana group, God, evangelism is allowing God to work, use you where he's already working. God is working in people's lives. I talked to somebody last week. I started uh, inviting him to church. He said, God has been speaking to me. It wasn't me. God's already working. Jesus knew what he was going to do, but he gave us the opportunity, gave the disciples the opportunity to have part in what God is doing. That, that's really what missions is about. That's what evangelism is about. They went to the Ukraine. Rich is going to Indonesia. Some of these other missionaries, they're just going, trusting that God is going to use them. And we go over there as Americans. We have a we have a lot of things against us. We're you know kind of spoiled, and we we're not very good with languages, and we're kind of pretentious sometimes about. Uh, you know, Ron was telling me he's trying to get professors over there, and they're asking, well, you know, how's the weather? It's cold, colder, and coldest in the Ukraine. What should that matter? God can work in the cold. God can work in the heat. doesn't matter. So I think that's really the thought. Hey, I want God to use you. Maybe say, oh, I can't give a lot of money. Well, a dollar, two dollars, a coffee, once a week, a sandwich. We have an abundance. Listen, we have abundance. And most of you have more junk that you haven't used in years in storage somewhere that people around the world could use. And so part of it is, is just, listen, God can use you. God has a place for you. There's nobody here that can say, I have no purpose in life. I have nothing. No, God wants to use you. And that's what it's all about. These, I can imagine, and Ron gave that illustration. Think about, think about what they came back and said. Man, fed all those people. Unbelievable. And we think about that. Think about, you know. Start his Bible college, and you'll see it if you watch on. You know, they started with a bunch of students. Every year it's grown. They've had over 1,700 students go through their Bible college. I'm sure he didn't expect that when he went over, but they just went over by faith. He had a, a comfortable teaching position, was a professor for 25 years, and, and he was down south at a nice school. And they asked him to go to Ukraine. Maybe. Maybe God's just asking you to go across the street. Maybe God's just asking you to maybe get involved in a ministry at the church. Maybe God's probably maybe not asking you to go across this, the ocean. But God can use you right here. So let him. Let's sing. If God's spoken to your heart, you come this morning. In the morning when 